Hi everyone, I'm super excited to welcome today an amazing GP of a big fund. She had been an investor in MongoDB, Fortscout, Frame, CloudLane, SnapRoad. She had been an investor at Intel, number two employee at Microsoft Fund, and currently she's a GP at B Capital. Welcome to SheVC. I'm your founder and host, Gayatri Sarkar. that we have Rashmi Gopinath. She's the GP of B Capital with us. And I'm so glad that you're on this show and you're with us, Rashmi. Yeah, same here. I'm really excited to be here. And kudos to you for highlighting female voices um, in the investment community. We definitely need more of these activities. Thank you so much, Rashmi. Um, my first question to you is that, uh, there are so much of things happening in the venture capital world. Obviously, we are talking about diversity and different kind of things. And you know, venture capital is a very hard industry to prepare for. You know, there is no MBA or coursework, and you had gone to Kellogg's. I would love to know what are your past experiences that prepared you for this journey. You know, Gayatri, to be honest, I wish I could tell you it was all planned and scripted, <laughs> um, but it wasn't. Um, my background has been, I would say, a little bit unique, and my journey into venture capital has been a little different from most VCs um, that, that we know of. I am an engineer by training, um, have an undergrad degree in engineering, and built products for the first half of my career at Oracle and at G Healthcare. And it was at G Healthcare where I was getting pulled into a lot of business level decisions around how do you price a product, how do you take a product to market, which was when I decided to get my business school degree at, at Kellogg. And that was where I got exposed into uh, the world of investments and entrepreneurship and ended up doing a couple of internships while I was at Kellogg. And I absolutely loved the, um, the experience of working with founders and entrepreneurs who are extremely smart, driven people. And um, I think as, as investors, we are very fortunate to, to be part of those, uh, those journeys and to be able to help build these truly transformative companies that, that can change the world. And so I would say that post Kellogg is when I switched full time into an investment role, first with Intel Capital and then with Microsoft and now with B Capital. And every single of the um, investments that I've made, I would say, has helped me learn and become incrementally better than what I was before. And that for me is truly exciting to, to be at that spearhead of technology innovation and to work with really smart people every day. That's amazing. And you know, when you talk about working with smart people, I mean, uh, we always, um, Thing that venture capital is one industry that has not been disrupted as such. And as with the movements we are seeing in Black Lives Matters, and we want diversity in the cap tables and diversity in our portfolios, and B Capital has 48% of female representation. And you are at the forefront of many top investments, you know, through m and and IPA journey. So tell me about your viewpoint of how you look at this diversity and when, how you're approaching these opportunities and um, being a catalyst for change, how you look at the market. Yeah, I would say the core fundamental for that stems from research data that shows that diversity is great for business. We have seen over and over again that diverse teams lead to better outcomes. We have seen that diverse portfolios yield better outcomes, which is, I mean, primarily the job that we have as investors is to build a truly diverse portfolio that diversifies risks across different sectors and different geographies. And I would say the key question that, that always comes back to me is why don't we practice what we preach yeah. and build that same level of diversity on our investment teams as well. If we look at the global number of female investors who can write checks at their respective funds, that number is still under 3%, which is abysmally low 
Um, if we see the same across uh, underrepresented minorities, the number is even lower. It's probably less than 1%. And the, I would say the, the change is coming. It's not coming soon enough. And the one thing that has been, I would say, frustrating to observe is while everybody recognizes that not enough funds do things to change those numbers, and I again feel very fortunate to be part of the V Capital Partnership team where this is, I would say, the core tenet of what we as a partnership believe in. That's cool. Every hire we make, we wanna make sure that our filters are broad enough. And I do want to reiterate, this is not a pipeline problem. The problem stems from the fact of not looking far enough and not looking deep enough. There are plenty of, um, really smart female investors, really smart underrepresented minority investors that we should be adding to our teams. And unfortunately, yeah, there's, there's enough said about it, but not enough done about it. And it's time that founders ask those questions of their investors as well, is tell Very me true. what are you doing about diversity and show me diverse investors that you can bring to my company. And LPs should be asking that question to their VC funds is what have you done about diversity and what do your numbers look like? I think the onus is on all of us to make sure that we do our bit to increase those diversity numbers at each of our funds. And I mean, there's a number of groups that, that are now focused on, on changing those dynamics. But like I said, the change isn't coming fast enough. Yeah, you just hit the nail. You said so nicely that we need to ask those questions and founders also have that power in asking those questions. And, you know, venture capital, we always say that, you know, they are, we, we are trying to identify so much of patterns that are going on. And yet some of the bigger ideas are very unpredictable. And um, can you elaborate the new market opportunities that you are seeing? And also, uh, you know, when you're investing in a growth fund like B Capital, um, are you affected with coronavirus? Because you guys are in San Francisco, New York, LA, Singapore. How does this uh, global portfolio affect, especially in this pandemic? Yeah, I would say the advantage of having a global footprint is that we truly get to invest in best-in-class companies, regardless of where they're based at. I'm sure a lot of investors would agree that innovation doesn't have to be limited to the Silicon Valley, it can come from any corner of the world. So true. But the challenge comes when you don't have presence in some of those markets. Yeah. You don't get to learn those dynamics. You don't see some of those companies. And we kind of become restricted in terms of the, the areas that, that we look at. So that I would say has definitely been a huge advantage for a fund like B Capital that has presence across multiple states in the United States, as well as a pretty deep presence in Southeast Asia, in regions like India, Indonesia, and Singapore, that we get to hedge our bets and we truly get to pick companies that are best in class globally. Um, in terms of, I would say, the effect of coronavirus, and I'm sure you've been hearing this from other funds as well, yeah. is that the first couple of months were more inward focused, making sure the portfolio companies are in a good spot with their cash runways and their operating expenses. And I would say since mid-April, um, the, there's definitely been a frenzy of investment activity as you may have noticed some of the recent funding announcements that have been coming through. There are a lot of companies that are either neutral or seeing positive tailwinds mm. from coronavirus. And so if you're in a healthcare space, if you're in a cybersecurity space, which interestingly, given that home is the new enterprise, leads to a lot of interesting challenges around providing that same level of cybersecurity visibility when you're outside of the protection of the enterprise firewall. Yeah. Um, and then there are industries like e-commerce and retail that are going through a complete transformation and are not able to sustain the demand that they're seeing through online channels. So I'd say there's, there's definitely a great opportunity for businesses to transform their traditional 
go-to-market motions and traditional traditional business models to adapt to this new way, which in some ways there are great indications that this will be the new normal. When it comes to things even on the enterprise side like future of work, we've seen many instances of large enterprises saying that not every employee has to be in the office every day going forward, which brings a lot of opportunities around new productivity and new collaboration tools that will become the norm going forward. So I would say in terms of growth stage investments, there's definitely a lot of opportunities in really strong companies and really strong founders that we've been seeing over the last um, few weeks, couple months, and that we believe is going to be the trend going forward. That's great. I would really love to understand from your perspective and share some of the learnings that you invested in these amazing companies. And you also sit on board on all these companies. Many of them are acquired, IPO'd. What are your, some of the learnings that you learned, uh, especially in, that you're bringing into B Capital? I mean, the learnings would be a day long conversation in itself. <laughs> uh, but if I have to kind of summarize it into a few points, um, I would say number one is really the team and the execution. Um, there's plenty of great ideas. There's no shortage of ideas. And the, the execution um, and the drive and the hustle that teams have to mm. quickly gain market share and to build a thoughtful process in how they get there on making sure their operational burn is in line with the growth that they're driving on the top line. That's all great. ties into a great, a great strategy on the execution side, which cannot be beat by anything. So I would say that team and execution is, is by far the biggest moat and the biggest winning strategy uh, that you see consistently in companies that, that make it big. Um, the second I would say is really having a, a fanatic drive towards customer satisfaction. And this again, you have seen a number of companies that do extremely well is customer success having an insane um, focus on customer retention and growth um, drives, drives immensely large values. So having that set in the company's DNA and culture from day one is, is going to be quite important and critical. And the third I would say is um, being very uh, aware of what the market dynamics and what the competitive landscape is evolving and changing into. And this is where startups have, would say, a leg up over some of the larger tech incumbents that get caught up on the innovator's dilemma part is they're not able to innovate and move fast enough. Sure. Is as a startup, you have that ability to be faster and nimble. And so be aware of what's going on in the market. Be aware of how your competitive landscape is evolving, evolving and shaping. I think COVID is a great example of that is you can't um, do sales or do marketing the way things have been done before. You can't yeah. make on customer visits. You don't have events and conferences to generate your leads. And so how do you adapt and change in that new yeah. market and be able to leverage digital and be able to leverage your channels and partners to, to grow your top line. I think all of those tie into, um, I would say some of the key traits or characteristics that, that we see in winning companies. Yeah, that's great. I think I totally agree with you because adoption is such a key uh, for any startup companies and you have an amazing experience as an operator. I would really love to know like the perception of credibility that an operator brings to the table, especially as a, as a board member. So what are your learnings and takeaways when you're at the board seat, when you're advising the startups? Absolutely. Um, so obviously there are many paths into venture capital, like how, I mean, we started off the conversation yeah. by saying the, the one thing that you would notice from investors that have been operators in the past is they definitely have that extra credibility with the founders and having been in the trenches and having had the battle scars of working with early stage or growth stage startups themselves and driving outsized values provides, I would say, more 
real-time empathy to what founders are going through and being more of a partner in the journey versus an advisor in the journey. Yeah. And there's a slight difference to that is we can all sit behind closed doors in boardrooms and advise companies on what they should be doing. But the perspective is, is very different when you've been in their shoes yeah. and you've done that. And I remember at my first operating experience at the seed stage company that I was in, we were a cloud infrastructure startup bringing the power of virtualization to big data deployments uh, back in the time and calling up the likes of a Comcast or um, a Bank of America and telling them that I'm this tiny seed stage company you've never heard of mm. and you should buy my infrastructure in your data center and replace what you have there, what you've been buying for the last 20 years is is not easy to do um, Very true. and I would say having, having done that I do have a ton of empathy and respect for sales leaders where it doesn't matter if you've completely beat your past quarter your next quarter you go back to zero and then yeah. you're proving yourself up again and so times where your um, your numbers may not hit the mark times where there are some external challenges beyond your control that happen I would say the Again, the investors that have been operators know how to recognize that, are able to be a true partner with the founders in, in their journeys, help them through the lows as well as the highs. Um, I think gives gives an incredibly um, trusted relationship with the founders. And I have found personally my own perspectives to be very different when I came back on the investment side post my operating experience than before. But like I said, that being said, everybody's got a different journey and there's um, really amazing investors who've had enough track record investing and have uh, been able to provide that same level of perspective through pattern matching over time for their investments, even though they might not have been operators in the past. Um, but my own personal journey, like I said, has been yeah very enriching post my operating experience. Um, and that I believe definitely gives me um, a lot of advantage when I'm working with the, with the management teams post investment. That's great. And I, I want to ask you the very last question, but the most important question is like venture capital is not a job. It's a lifestyle. And you know, um, it's not like you shut off being a VC in the weekends it's 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 just a very different kind of a career so how do you manage this kind of a lifestyle what are the learning habits you have acquired how do you make your work life balance because you're a mother you have so many things going on in life so how do you manage this life so i to totally agree with you guys it's <laughs> definitely not a job we never switch off um i don't think there's ever been a weekend where I have not spoken with one of my founders or have uh, spent time learning about a new industry uh, or yeah. going deep in one of the existing ones. I think a lot of it ties back to the question of why are we doing this? Yeah. And for me, if I ask myself the question, what makes me excited and enthusiastic about what I'm doing? It's really two key things. It's one, I think, like I said, we're, we're fortunate um, yeah. and it's very humbling to be part of this journey with founders mm -hmm. and the ability to work with them on these truly disruptive and innovative ideas. And the second is a, a shared passion for technology. Um, sure. Having been in product and engineering roles myself, I mean, I have seen firsthand how technology can truly change how business is done, how we work, how we live. Um, I remember from my time at G Healthcare, where we were building this uh, data analytics and ML based product to help predict readmission rates in hospital and how do you ensure that care delivery is consistent across multiple um, hospitals and health systems. And visiting hospitals and seeing firsthand that you are actually able to improve a patient's life by doing that is very rewarding. And that if you multiply across the number of sectors that we can invest in, that we can truly make that change in is, is super exciting. And to see 
what technology can do next, like what is the next frontier that's going to be disrupted. Um, again, it's, I find it to be a truly exciting thing to do every day. I'm really fortunate to, to be in this role where I can do that and I can deliver on that. So combining those two things, I would say it's, it's not a job that's, that any of us do it with a nine to five kind of a consideration. It's what drives us. It's what yeah. we're passionate about. Um, and when you find that, that mix between your true passion and what you get to do every day, um, you see that as, as part of your life. So yeah, it's, it's, it's been a great, uh, great enriching experience. And I see myself doing this for the foreseeable future. Wow. Thank you so much, Rashmi, for your time. I'm so proud and honored to have you because you brought so much of experiences to the table and talked in length about your experience as an operator and your experience as a board member. We are truly honored to have you, Rashmi. Thanks so much, Gayatri. It's been a pleasure and good luck with the, the rest of the interviews. Like I said, kudos to you for doing this and uh, really excited to hearing other female voices on your podcast as well. Thank you so much, Rashmi.